Thanks for tuning in. Today, we're going to talk about the first step in a gene becoming a protein. This process is known as transcription. Transcription is the conversion of DNA into a molecule of RNA, which will later be translated into a protein by the ribosome. We'll talk about translation in a different video. Today, it's all about transcription, so stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. The flow of genetic information in all living things is unidirectional. Genetic information is stored in the form of DNA, which is then converted into an RNA message, and then translated into a protein. This is what we refer to as the central dogma of molecular biology, the flow of genetic information from DNA to RNA to protein. The first step in this process, the conversion of DNA into an RNA message, is called transcription, and that's what we're going to talk about today. The process of transcription, just like we saw with DNA replication, is highly conserved between both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Of course, there are some subtle differences owing to the differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. As is typical, it's a little bit more complex in eukaryotes because they typically have more proteins involved or slightly different mechanisms to regulate the process. We'll talk about that a bit later on in the video. But the general mechanism is highly conserved. And if I were to summarize it very briefly, it's like this. DNA serves as a double-stranded template for an enzyme called RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase comes in, it reads one strand of the DNA that encodes a gene. That strand is called the template strand. The RNA polymerase comes in, synthesizes a new molecule of messenger or mRNA that is complementary to the template strand. Because it's complementary to the template strand, it's actually identical to the opposite strand of DNA, which we call the coding strand except for the fact that it's made out of RNA, which means instead of having T's, it has U's. This messenger RNA is produced by RNA polymerase until RNA polymerase reaches the end of the gene. RNA polymerase comes off, and that messenger RNA can then go on and be translated into a protein. That's it. Easy peasy, right? But I think you all know it can't be just that easy, because what I just described leaves several questions to be answered. So, for example... How does RNA polymerase know where genes are located? How does it know which segments of DNA actually contain genes? Another question, how does RNA polymerase know where a gene begins and where a gene ends? And also, you can't have all of your genes active or expressed at the same time. That would lead to chaos. So how does RNA polymerase know which genes to transcribe and which genes not to transcribe? And that's what we're going to talk about for the, for the majority of the remainder of this video. How does RNA polymerase do this? How does transcription actually occur in a regulated fashion so that the right chunks of DNA are being transcribed at the right times? Okay, so let's begin by answering the first question. How does a RNA polymerase know where a gene begins? Well, what's interesting is RNA polymerase doesn't actually look for genes. What it looks for are small segments of DNA that lie upstream of genes that are called promoters. So promoters exist in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Typically in prokaryotes they're smaller and they're a little bit less complex. And when you look at a prokaryotic promoter there's going to be a couple of key DNA sequences that we find in all prokaryotic promoters. One of them is called the minus 35 consensus sequence. Uh, this consensus sequence is one of the important sequences that are needed in order for RNA polymerase to actually bind to a promoter just downstream of that, so between the minus 35 and the start of the gene, there is what we call a minus 10 Tata box. So a Tata box is given its name because it consists mainly of uh, T and A nucleotides, so it just kind of spells out Tata, as you can see. Now, where we get the numbers minus 35 and minus 10, that is referencing how far upstream of the gene they lie. So the minus 35 consensus sequence, for example, is 35 nucleotides before or upstream of the gene. And the Tata box at minus 10 is 10 nucleotides before or upstream of the gene as well. If we look at a eukaryotic promoter, they're going to be often bigger. So they'll often stretch for thousands of nucleotides upstream of the gene that they regulate. 
and uh, they're also going to only have the Tata box. Uh, in eukaryotes, the Tata box has a slightly different sequence, and it usually lies somewhere between minus 25 and minus 35 uh, upstream of the genes that they regulate. The other thing we often see in eukaryotes are enhancer regions. So enhancer regions are even farther upstream than the promoter is. And it turns out that in order for most eukaryotic genes to be expressed properly, you need to be you need to have special proteins that activate both the enhancer and the promoter region of that of of a given gene in order to have it activated. We'll talk about how that works in just a few minutes. So we know now that RNA polymerase needs to land on a promoter region upstream of the genes that it's going to transcribe. But how then does RNA polymerase know which gene promoters to land on? Well, the answer to this question is different depending on whether we're talking about prokaryotes or eukaryotes. So first thing we have to acknowledge is that not every gene in a, in a cell needs to be transcribed at all, all the time, basically. So there needs to be a way of deciding or differentiating which genes are expressed and which genes aren't, which genes are being transcribed and which genes aren't. In E. coli cells, for example, uh, and most bacteria, there are proteins that are called sigma factors. And sigma factors act are, are, are proteins that are activated in response to broad changes in the cellular environment. And they dictate broad parts of the, the cell's activity in which genes are expressed in response to that. So for example, uh, there are, there, E. coli has seven sigma factors. One of them is involved in uh, iron metabolism. They'll have another one involved in replication. So these sigma factors will get activated as the cellular conditions change. And then they, in turn, will land on the promoter regions of the genes that they regulate. So for example, if it's time for the cell to grow and divide. Uh, the sigma factors will, that are in charge of that process will land on genes that are involved in growth and cell division. In doing so, they will land on those promoters and then recruit RNA polymerase specifically to the promoter regions of those genes. Now, can RNA polymerase bind to a prokaryotic promoter uh, without the presence of a sigma factor? It can. Um, but typically, sigma factors make it much more efficient. They make it much more likely uh, that that gene will be expressed. So sigma factors are one way of sort of making sure that certain genes are active while other genes aren't in prokaryotic cells. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, have transcription factors. So unlike E. coli, which has seven sigma factors, your cells have somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,500 different transcription factors. What that means is you have... What that means is the transcription factors in your cells uh, are responsible for much narrower gene regulation. In other words, they don't regulate nearly as many genes as sigma factors do. They're not going to just turn on this particular metabolism wholesale. For example, rather than having one transcription factor that just says, okay, it's time to do um, catabolic metabolism, you'll have one, one set of transcription factors that specifically regulates just glycolysis and another set of transcription factors that specifically regulate just things that happen in the citric acid cycle, so on and so forth. Okay, so you have much finer control. And transcription factors are broken down into two broad classes. You have your general transcription factors and your specific transcription factors. So regardless of what type of transcription factor we're talking about, they're going to have a consensus binding sequence. So consensus binding sequences are little stretches of DNA that are specifically targeted by transcription factors, which again are proteins. Um, so they will bind to specific regions of DNA that have the particular sequence that they recognize. Specific transcription factors are going to bind in those distal regulatory elements, those enhancers. And they are what are going to control differential gene expression. So they are going to make sure that the enhancers of certain genes are on when those transcription factors have been activated by cellular cues. So maybe it is time to do glycolysis. So those transcription factors that regulate glycolytic genes will be activated. They will head to certain regions uh, throughout your chromosomes that um, have these enhancer regions of genes that have the consensus binding sequence. They will bind there. That's step one in activating transcription. The next thing you actually need are general transcription factors. And general transcription factors typically bind to the promoter region. They are going to bind to the promoter region uh, and they are going to set up uh, the transcription complex. Uh, it's called the transcription initiation complex. So there's several of these and they all assemble to form this transcription initiation complex, which then and only then can recruit RNA polymerase to that particular promoter. So you can see 
in eukaryotic cells, it's a lot more complicated to get RNA polymerase there. It's not as simple as sigma factor binds, recruits RNA polymerase, transcription is a go. No, in order for transcription to actually start on a eukaryotic gene, you have to have specific transcription factors at the enhancer, you have to have general transcription factors binding at the promoter to assemble the transcription initiation complex, and then they have to recruit and load RNA polymerase onto the gene. So that, so in that sense, that is how transcription is, that's how tra RNA polymerase, whether it's in E. coli or bacterial cells, or whether it's in your cells, eukaryotic cells, that is how RNA polymerase knows which gene promoters it is supposed to be on in order to promote transcription of said genes. Okay, so the third question we need to ask ourselves then is, how does RNA polymerase know where a gene ends? The short answer to that, it doesn't. Uh, RNA polymerase doesn't really know where a gene ends, it has to kind of be told. Uh, in prokaryotes, there are two different mechanisms for this. Uh, the first one is called the Rho dependent mechanism. So Rho is this protein that's able to bind to the messenger RNA. So as RNA polymerase is producing this strand of messenger RNA, Rho binds, and then it slowly starts to kind of walk its way up the mRNA molecule, and eventually what happens is it kind of outpaces the RNA polymerase as it's polymerizing the new mRNA molecule, and once Rho catches up, it just basically bumps, um, it, it, it bumps the RNA polymerase right off of the DNA uh, and ends the process of transcription. So that's Rho dependent. Um, other genes are not terminated. Uh, other gene transcriptions are not terminated in a Rho dependent manner. Uh, they are terminated be, because what happens is that the, the sequence within the messenger RNA is actually complementary to itself, and it kind of forms this hairpin um, where the, it, it's stuck together. So it's almost like it hits a snag, and that sort of motion kind of causes RNA polymerase to like jerk to a stop. And at that point, it's like, oh, I think we're done here. Uh, and then, then, uh, then transcription is terminated at that point as RNA polymerase comes off. If we look at eukaryotes, eukaryotes don't have uh, like a row dependent mechanism uh, like that at all. So instead what happens in most eukaryotic genes is transcription is actually gonna carry way past um, the end of the gene as it would be when it gets translated. So what we would call the translational stop codon. Uh, it's, it goes way past, often thousands of bases past. Now, uh, what'll end up happening is uh, a, 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 an enzyme will actually bind to that messenger RNA as it's coming off, kind of like Rho does. But rather than dislodging the RNA polymerase, what it's going to do is it's going to bind at a specific site um, and then kind of work its way along the messenger RNA until it reaches this, this region where an internal cut site can be made. So the enzyme reaches this region uh, and it cuts the mRNA there. And at that point, the, the RNA polymerase recognizes that the mRNA has been cut behind it. Uh, and that causes the RNA polymerase to dissociate from the DNA. And at that point, transcription is terminated. So um, again, we see that it's sort of the same basic idea. RNA polymerase doesn't just go, oh, I'm done and, and fall off. There has to be some sort of signal to tell RNA polymerase that the job is done, whether it's Rho uh, in, in, um, whether it's Rho in, in bacteria or the row independent mechanism or in eukaryotes, this sort of internal cleavage um, of the molecule, of the mRNA molecule behind the RNA polymerase. But what happens after transcription? And this is where we start to see some very big differences between bacteria and, uh, and, and eukaryotes. Um, bacteria, uh, their genomes are actually very tight. They don't have any sort of, they don't have a lot of extra DNA. Most of their DNA is actually either a regulatory region or a gene itself. And the big thing about bacterial genes is they do not contain these little sequences called introns. Essentially, all of the information inside of a bacterial gene is needed in order to be translated into the proper protein. So once a bacterial mRNA is produced, it is mature. In fact, one of the things that quite often happens during uh, transcription in bacteria uh, and other prokaryotes is the formation of something called a polyribosome complex. Essentially, even as RNA polymerase is still transcribing that messenger RNA, ribosomes are already binding to that messenger RNA and beginning the process of translation. So you could have translation from an mRNA transcript prior to transcription even being ended uh, in prokaryotes. And this is made possible, one, by the fact that they uh, the, the mRNA is already mature and it's ready to be translated, but two, there's no nucleus. So in bacteria and other prokaryotes, there is no nucleus and the ribosomes are allowed to just be in free contact with that messenger RNA as soon as it's produced. This is not the case in eukaryotes. So the first thing we have to talk about in terms of eukaryotes is the structure of their genes. 
Eukaryotic genes have lots of different regions inside of them that are called introns. So if you actually look at a messenger RNA after it's been produced, you will notice um, there are different regions within that mRNA. You'll have these little sequences that are called exons or expressed sequences. This is the information in the mRNA that will eventually be translated into a protein. But in between these exons that encode useful information, you have these regions that are called intervening sequences or introns. And most genes in eukaryotes have several different introns. The first thing we have to do uh, before we can do translation is get rid of those introns. But before we do this process called splicing, one of the things that's going to happen is, actually the most important thing that's going to happen is each mRNA needs to be given a, a 5 prime methyl guanylate cap. So it's a specially modified G nucleotide that gets placed at the 5' prime end, so the start of that particular mRNA. And then at the end of the RNA, you're going to get something called a 3' prime poly A tail. It's basically just a long run of A's. What the 5' prime cap and the 3' prime tail do is, first off, they designate that mRNA as mature. So when that mRNA gets secreted out of the nucleus, to begin translation, ribosomes will not work on a, an mRNA that doesn't have a 5' prime cap and a poly A tail. It also promotes stability because if your cells detect an mRNA that doesn't have a 5' prime cap and a poly A tail, they automatically degrade them because they know that there's probably something wrong with them. They haven't undergone the right maturation process for translation to occur. The next thing that's going to happen is the removal of these introns. These introns are cut out through a process called splicing. So what will end up happening under you know, basic conditions, all of those introns will be cut out and then they will be spliced back together so that the remaining mature mRNA has a 5' prime cap, a 3' prime poly A tail, and all exonic information. So all the exons will be stitched together uh, to make the mature mRNA. But one of the really interesting things that can happen following splicing or during splicing is a process called alternative splicing. And it turns out that perhaps the majority of eukaryotic genes have the capability of being alternatively spliced. Why is this important? Well, What's interesting about alternative splicing, alternative splicing happens when, during the splicing process, not only are all of the introns removed, but some of the exons get removed too. So essentially what that means is you can have a single gene in eukaryotes that can produce multiple versions of the same protein. So for example, you might have one version of the protein where um, it's embedded in the plasma membrane, but if you cut out this exon here, for example, now it's a secreted protein. Or if you cut out these two axons, oh, well, guess what? Now it's a protein that's located inside the lysosome. Same protein with the same functionality, but it can dictate how it's expressed or where it's located or whether it's secreted or put into a membrane. It also can increase the diversity of a protein. Let me give you a really cool example of this. Alternative splicing is the mechanism by which the majority of your antibodies are made. In fact, all of your antibodies are made through alternative splicing. So... How does this help? Well, it turns out that your body can produce billions of different antibodies from a handful of genes because these genes that encode those antibody proteins have hundreds or dozens of different exons that can be alternatively spliced together to give you the ability to produce billions of different antibodies in combination, which is really, really cool and also helps you keep you alive. So splicing is a thing that only is found in eukaryotes because only eukaryotes have introns. This process is also co-opted to do alternative splicing, which allows a single eukaryotic gene to encode multiple versions of the same protein, which is really cool. So in this video, we talked about transcription. Transcription is the first step in the process of a gene becoming a protein. It's the conversion of DNA into a messenger RNA or an mRNA molecule. The next step in the process is translation, and we will talk about that in the next video. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you learned a lot today, and I look forward to seeing you soon.